So what I'm talking about, it's joint work over the last seven or eight years with Sylvia Anscombe, Charlie Steinhorn, and Daniel Wolf. Daniel Wolf was a PhD student of mine a few years ago. Um, uh, okay, so the structure of the talk. Um, I'll start by talking about um, this well-known theorem from 1990 about definable sets in finite fields, uh, um, a theorem of Chattadakis, Van der Dries, and McIntyre. Uh, and I'll talk about a kind of model theoretic generalization which was developed. Um, and, and I'll then um, talk about a more, more recent version that we're developing with Anscombe and Steinhorn and Wolf, um, this notion of a, a multidimensional asymptotic class and a generalized measurable structure. And I'll focus very much on examples. There are, there are probably more examples than theorems so far. Um, and then there's a particular angle on this that I, rather appeals to me, which is what we're calling these exact classes. I'll give definitions later. And then a, a connection to homogeneous structures in the sense of presse. Um, I think I think there's some nice combinatorial questions there. Okay, um, so I'll start with this theorem of Chattadakis, Van den Ries, and McIntyre. So the idea is it's looking at definable sets in finite fields, looking at the cardinality of them. So you work in the language of rings, plus minus time zero one, and you look at a formula, any formula. Phi, and you partition its variables into x bar and y bar. Um, so the idea is that such a formula in any structure gives you a family of definable sets. Because for any parameters a1 to am for the y variables, you get a definable set in the x variables. So parameter sets parameterized by the y variables. So you're looking at, you're looking at families of definable sets, but we're interested uniformly across all finite fields. So this statement is already quite hard to parse, I think. Um, so it says that um, given such a formula, we're looking at finite fields, then, um, well, there's a constant C, and then the crucial thing, there are finitely many pairs, D mu, where D is a natural number like between zero and little n, which is the number of x variables, and mu is some positive rational. So that if you look in any finite field on a few elements, you look at such a field, interpret the formula phi in that field, and take any parameters a bar for the y variables. So you get a definable, you get a definable set in the x variables. That's that phi fq to the n we set here. So assuming that set is not empty, then for one of those finitely many pairs di mu i, the set has size roughly mu i q to the di. So such a definable set has size roughly mu one q to the d one, or roughly mu, mu two q to the d two, and so on. When I say roughly, I mean the difference is constant times q to a smaller power. So that's a kind of error term. So that's the sort of statement. So we're saying that you fix a formula that across all finite fields, and parameters are very freely, then definable sets have approximately one of a fixed number of sizes. They have a particular type. And there's a, there's a further part two that says that there's a kind of definability clause, which says that for each of these pairs, d mu, there's a corresponding formula psi just in the y variables, which tells you which me, d mu is applicable. So for each di mu i, there's a formula psi i. So the psi i holds of a bar precisely if the corresponding inequality holds. So psi i of a bar says that um, this equation here holds for the same pair mu i di. So it's rather like saying something like that Morley rank is definable or Morley degree is definable or some sort of rank is definable. It's that kind of condition. If 
definability condition. But already without two, just condition one is saying quite a lot. Okay. As a little corollary, just to get a, this, when when these speaker, these people were giving talks about this thirty years ago, they always mentioned this corollary. And I think it answers a question of Falconer. So you can immediately read off that in a finite field on p squared elements, you can't in a uniform way define the prime subfield of p elements. So of course that's the it's that f p will be the solution set of x equals x to the p. But that's not uniform because we can't, in a uniform way, talk about x to the p and the ring. So why is this? Well, we're, we're, look, we're working in the field fp squared. So our structure is fp squared. fp is a subset of fp squared. So if we could define it, it'd be, be by formula phi where n equals one it's in, into one space. So we'd, we'd need to be able to define a subset of the structure of size the square root of the structure. But if n equals one, then you can see here that d, d, d will be zero or one. If d is zero, then the set just has finite fixed bounded size, like a most 17. If d is one, then this says that roughly it's the definable set has size constant times q like half q or a third of q. But it couldn't, be the, it couldn't be the square root of q, which is p squared here. So you get this corollary very quickly. OK, <clears throat> so that was this theorem of Kasiadakis, Van der Luce, McIntyre. So it was work of myself and Charlie Steinhorn from 2008, and then my students, Richard Elway's Mark Wrighton, that developed the, this theorem into a, into a definition into a sort of model theoretic framework where, so, so we, 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 we call this a one-dimensional asymptotic class. So you, think, you take any first order language and you look at a, a class of finite structures in this language satisfying the conclusion of the theorem. So it makes sense. I mean, that, the, the, that theorem was quite formulaic. It was done in the language of rings, but it could have been any language. So it makes sense just to talk about a, a class of structures in a finite language satisfying that theorem. We slightly loosen it. We loosen it. We, in the theorem, the mu i's were rationals. We allow the mu i to be irrational, and we weaken the error term. We just say little o of something. Okay, sorry. And then. Okay, that's a one-dimensional asymptotic class, but there's a natural higher dimensional version. You could talk about an n-dimensional version. So for example, if you look at the, the collection of groups, SL2Q, you know, this, is, this is two by two determinant one matrices over the field of Q elements, then, well, that's very, these groups are defined from the fields. They're very, very close to the fields. That ought to be something like an asymptotic class, but it's naturally three-dimensional. You've got, you've got two by two matrices, so you've got four entries, you've got the equation saying determinant one, so there are three degrees of freedom, so it should be three-dimensional. So I always gave a, gave a definition of an n-dimensional asymptotic class, which picks up things like this. And then Mark Wrighton found a very nice example of a, a one-dimensional asymptotic class, which is a proper expansion of finite field. So it's an extension of the Chattanooga's Van der Luce McIntyre theorem. So here you're fixing a prime. Okay, so prime, P is fixed, and you fix a pair of positive integers, M and N, like this. And you look at the class C, M, N, P. So these are fields, characteristic P, of order F, P, what? P to the K, N plus M. But they're not pure fields, they're fields equipped with an automorphism, they're what's called difference fields. So you have a, you have a unary function symbol for, for an automorphism, which is interpreted by the kth power of the Frobenius. So by the function, x goes to x to the p to the k. Okay, so 
Here, P, M, and N are fixed, but K is varying. That gives you a class of structures, these, these difference fields. So the, this is a, a one-dimensional asymptotic class. And this rests on a difficult result, actually, which is still not published to Kuzovsky from around 2000, which is a, it's basically on the limit theory of structures FQL, so algebraic closure of FQ, equipped with the automorphism X goes to X to the Q. You look at the limit theory as Q goes to infinity. So it's a very deep paper of Kuzovsky on this. Um, basically, he shows that this limit theory is a certain well-known theory ASFA. And then Reitman's result comes out of that. So, I mean, I, I would tend to see Wrighton's results as a little bit in the same spirit as, as say, Wilkie's results about model completeness of the real exponential field or luminality. I mean, I don't want to make comparisons, but, it, but it, in a sense that it's, it's talking about an interesting proper expansion of a familiar structure. And I mean, it, it's difficult. It's resting on this difficult result of Ruchowski. And that, that the, the, real, the real depth is in Ruchowski's work there. Okay, uh, Wrighton obtained a nice corollary of this, that if you, it's about, it's about finite simple groups. So we have the classification of finite simple groups. So you have, of course, a cyclic prime, prime order. And then you have alternating groups. You have sporadics. And then you have these various families of matrix groups, which are determined by a, a Dinkin diagram and a Lie type. So this says that for any fixed Lie type, possibly twisted, there's a certain notion of a twisted simple group, then the collection of all finite simple groups of that type is an asymptotic class. So for example, the group of all, the class of all groups, PSL2Q is an asymptotic class, or the class of all groups PSL3Q is not a asymptotic class, or symplectic groups SP4Q, or things like this. Um, so, um, the idea of the proof. Is sorry, that, sorry, uh, yes. Dougal, maybe I, I missed it, but, uh, asymptotic is, uh, asym n asymptotic for some n or. That's right. I mean, n asymptotic for some n. So roughly, okay. let's go back a moment, actually. Um, okay. Thanks. Uh, let's get back to this roughly. So here in this original theorem. Bi goes from zero up to little n, the number of variables. In a capital N dimensional asymptotic class, Bi would go from zero up to little n times capital N. Okay. You slightly tweak the, the, the kind of inequality there, but that's essentially the idea. But to high, so asymptotic class for us just means n dimensional for some n. Okay, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so, so the idea is that for most of these classes of finite simple groups, they essentially are uniformly bi-interpretable with finite fields. Maybe there's some use of parameters there, but that's the idea. But there are, there, are, there are three classes of finite simple groups, namely Suzuki and regroups, where you really need these difference fields. So you need to work with this expansion by automorphism. Um, and just to, just to sort of indicate the kind of thing this tells us, it says the following. So fix a Lie type. So that gives you one of these asymptotic classes, the finite simple groups. Then there will be finitely many pairs, the i mu i. So that for any finite simple group G of this type, each conjugacy class of G has size roughly mu times the order of G to the exponent little d over n one of these pairs d mu class. So there's a lot of control over the sizes of conjugate classes in the group. And the, and the reason you just apply the right in result where the formula phi x y just says x and y are conjugate. So conjugate classes are a typical example of a, a, definable, a, fa a definable family of definable sets. So you, you use a member of the class as a parameter. I think this this result must be well known, but it's a nice example of something you can read off from writing the result. 
Okay, I'll give you a few other examples of n-dimensional asymptotic classes. Um, so finite cyclic groups form a one-dimensional asymptotic class. That's maybe not too surprising, because after all, we know that finite fields form an asymptotic class, and the multiplicative group of a field is cyclic. Still, this is all finite cyclic groups, so something has to be proved there. Um, more graph theoretic. So the notion of the Paley graph, very nice graph theory construction. It's a, it's a graph, you fix a um, Q of prime power congruent to one mod four, and you look at the field FQ, so the Paley graph has vertex set the elements of the F FQ, and two vertices X and Y are joined precisely if X minus Y is a square of FQ. So the idea is this is symmetric because, because Q is one mod four, minus one is a square. So X minus Y is a square, if and only if Y minus X is a square. So this is, this is actually of course, definable in finite fields. One shouldn't be too surprised, but this is a one dimensional asymptotic class. Uh, and this, this uh, what's sort of behind this really is, ultimately uh, behind a lot of this, there's the, the lang veil estimate for finite fields, but the kind of character sums argument of Bolabash and Thomason, which says the following, about, uh, this is about Paley graphs. So suppose, so in a Paley graph, suppose U and W are disjoint sets of vertices where the union has size M. And let little v U W be the number of vertices in the Paley graph joined to everything in U and nothing in W. Join to all U, none of W. And then that, that number of vertices is roughly Q times one over two to the M. So it's, it sort of suggests a probabilistic argument where for each vertex, the probability it's correctly joined to U union W is one over two to the M, right? Because there, there, are, there, are, there, are, there are M vertices in U union W. And so it's saying that the, the probabilistic argument actually fits what actually happens. So the difference is small, it's lower, lower exponent than Q. Um, so, so we have this. So roughly speaking, this is, this is, this is tell you, it tells you in particular that so long as Q is big enough, there is a vertex correctly joined to U union W. That tells you that any non principal algebra product of these Paley graphs is a model of the theory of the random graph, Rado's graph, which is this countably infinite graph, which exactly says that these, these, this kind of axiom always holds that for any, any two finite disjoint sets, U and W, there is a vertex joined to all U and none W. So this tells us that the, the limit theory is the random graph. So the random graph has quantum elimination. So that tells you that any formula in a sufficiently large Paley graph is equivalent to a quantify free formula. So in verifying the kind of asymptotic class condition, you only need to look at quantify free formulas. And then there's not very much to do, it's fairly easy. Okay, so we get this. And that, that's, so that gives you a nice class of examples of, of graphs, which are asymptotic class. Another example, um, Ricardo bello um, he showed that if you look at residue rings, Z mod P to the NZ, just a ring, here prime, um, then they form an N-dimensional asymptotic class. On the other hand, just to sort of see what asymptotic class is saying, if you look at the collection of all finite total orders, just in the Lang's Lewin ordering, that definitely is not asymptotic class. It's not an n-dimensional class for any n. 
And the reason is you have this formula phi x y just saying x less than y. And you can, if you're given a finite total order, you can choose y to be anywhere in the order. So that the definable set picked up by this is any initial segment, which is any proportion of the structure. They couldn't hope to be a Nussenbrin class. So that's all entirely about finite structures. But there's a corresponding infinitary notion. Uh, this was developed in the paper of myself and Steinhorns. We talk about a, a measurable structure. So I won't give a definition now, but you'll see something similar later. But the idea of a measurable structure is an infinite structure. And the idea is that you can, you, for any definable set, you can assign a pair d mu to it. So d is a positive integer, mu is a, say, a rational or real. Um, and you get similar kind of counting properties as hold for asymptotic classes. So you, you, you maximize this notion. You think of it as what should hold for an ultra product of an asymptotic class. So there's a notion that makes good sense. And then one can show that any ultra product of an asymptotic class is measurable. So in particular, um, there's the notion of a pseudo finite field, which is a, an infinite model of the theory of finite fields. Or if you like, it's it's an elementary equivalent to an ultra product of finite fields. So you get that any pseudo finite field is measurable. So the idea here is that an ultra product of definable sets of size roughly mu q to the d will be assigned the pair d mu above. The counting sort of carries through the ultra product. And measurable, it's a kind of it's a nice condition in the sense of kind of model theoretic stability theory. Okay, so we have this kind of hierarchy of conditions in stability theory of super stable, stable, simple, NIP, and so on. Um, so measurable structures are super simple, which is a, a strong version of being a simple theory. Um, and there's, no, there's a corresponding notion of rank. So it's super simple finite rank. It sits you in that setting. But again, maybe it's useful to have a, a sort of a non example. If you look at the complex field, there's a very model theory, a very nice structure. It's strongly minimal, has quantum elimination. But this is not measurable. So it doesn't have the kind of good counting properties that measurability gives. And the reason is that you have this two to one subjection x goes to x squared on the non-zero complex numbers so you've got a two to one map but you've also got the identity um, on the non-zero complex numbers so you've got a two to one map and not and a one to one map measurability just rules that out so it does rule out some natural examples um, and i'll also mention that although we obtain measurable structures as in one, as ultra products of asymptotic classes of finite structures. There are measurable structures which don't arise in this way. So in particular, are not pseudo-finite. So then they're, they're not kind of limits of finite structures. Okay, so that, that was the kind of background from say 2008, 2010. I want to move on to the more recent work. So that sort of setting of asymptotic classes and measurable structures was very much focused around the, the canonical examples of finite fields or things very close to finite fields. And we'd like to get a wider range of examples. So this, what might we look for? We might want to allow different parts of the structure, maybe different sorts in some sense, or definable sets, to vary independently. And, and still have some control about cardinalities. Um, we want to broaden the framework so not to sort of force our things to be, say, super simple or simple, finite rank. So we want, we want some model theoretically broader class. And I'm not going to worry 
about what the functions are which give you approximate cardinalities of definable sets. So for finite fields, we looked at functions q goes to mu q to the d, constant times q to the exponent. But for now, I don't want to worry about what those functions are. I want to be more open-minded on that. But we, we want to keep some key finiteness condition, which is the following. So we're going to be looking at a class of finite structures. We want this condition that for any formula phi, so such a formula will determine in each structure a family of definable sets in the, vec in the x variables. So for every such formula, there should be a number n phi, depending just on phi, so that in each structure in the class, the definable sets in the family have one of n phi many possible approximate sizes. So we're restricting the number of different sizes. So that's the idea. The sizes will vary with the structure. We're not too worried what the, what the sizes are. We just want to restrict the number of different sizes. And we also keep a definability clause, as in the, the theorem at the start. And I, mean, I, I mentioned earlier that total orders are not an, not an asymmetric class. And for the same reason, our, our new framework won't allow total orders because of this formula. OK, so we're looking for something like that. So the examples we'd hope to pick up, so some examples, um, you might look at two sorted structures. We have a finite field FQ, a vector space V over FQ. So I don't mean in the language of modules. I mean here where you've got the, the group language on V, you've got the ring language on FQ, and for scalar multiplication, you've got a function V cross FQ to V. So we, that's a typical kind of example. And here, both the dimension of V and FQ can vary freely. And you might want to put a bilinear form or something like that on V or quadratic form. Or just extending that a little bit, you might take, say, three sorted structures, so V, FQ as above, and W just some subspace of V. Or it could be, say, a sequence of length V of subspaces, something like that. Or another very simple example, you might just look at say disjoint unions of complete graphs all of the same size. So n copies of Km, where n and m are varying freely and independently. They can be anything. So that's a kind of example that ought to fit. In fact, finite abelian groups, in fact, they do fit our framework we're looking for. It's quite strange because with finite abelian groups, you can, they, they're, OK, you have this sort of decomposition into the prime powers, but still there's, you know, there's a lot of, lots of flexibility in definable sets. And finite graphs of bounded degrees. You bound the, the, the maximum degree of a vertex. They should fall as our framework. OK, so I'll, I'll try to describe this framework. This is, this, is, this is always the stage of this talk where everything goes wrong. Um, I, I always find this definition hard to convey. Maybe I've not found the right way to explain it. So do, do push me on this. Um, so we're looking at, uh, the, there'll be two slides which give, which give the definition that we're interested in here. So we have a fixed language L. We're looking at a class C of finite L structures. And let's just think of a tuple Y bar of variables. Just think of as potential parameters. Then I'll use this curly CY as a notation for the collection of all pairs M A bar, where M is in the class of structures, and A bar is just some parameters from M of the length of Y. So you can think of these as pointed structures, just a structure in the class and a choice of some 
parameters of the y variable. Okay. And then we'll be interested in partition of CY, so finite partition, meaning a partition with finitely many parts. So the idea is that if we have a partition of CY, then for any structure in the class, it gives you uniformly a partition of Y space. So uh, according to what part M A bar is in. So such a partition is zero definable if for each part in the partition, there's a formula in the Y variables, just depending on that part, the parameters. So that in any structure M in the class, phi P of M is just the parameters such as MB is in that part. So the idea, we're just talking about um, where in a uniform way, we're partitioning Y space into a fixed number of parts, and in a uniform way, we can define each part. We've got a single formula which will define one of the parts in each structure. Uh, that's basically what I was just saying. So, by partitioning Y space uniformly across the class of structures into a fixed finite number of parts, and each part in a uniform way is definable in, in each structure in the class. So you, you're, the, the part containing the element MB bar is, to, is defined by the formula phi sub B. Okay. Do go and Sorry, say, yeah, can I yeah. interrupt? Yeah, sure. Um, so you're saying in your class C Y bar, the same structure can um, can appear with different parameters. So you can have pairs M A bar and pairs. So sure. you can have the same structure appearing with two tuples of parameters. Yeah, yeah, sure. Is sure, that the sure. point? Uh, that's sort of the point. Okay. Yes, yes, okay. yes. So, Thanks. so. We're, we're, we're allowing both the structure to vary in the class and the parameters vary in the structure. Okay, and that's what the formula does. That's right. But, so, yeah, so, okay, the, 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 so for each structure M in the class, you get this, you get this um, partition of the parameter space. Yeah, okay. And the formula defines the parts. Well, the formula for each part, the formula phi P defines that part. It defines it uniformly across all the structures in the class. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Okay. So now we have this. This we we seem to land terrible terminology. Ah, uh, multi-dimensional asymptotic class. Ah, Mac. Um, so. We'll take R to be any collection of functions from our class of structures to the positive reals. We can think of it as something like a ring of functions, but just take it as any collection of functions. Okay. Um, and we might get stronger results if you specify what R is, but at this stage is anything. So a class of finite L structures is an R Mac. If for every formula phi, you get one of these partitions of, of CY. And correspondingly, for each part, you get a function, H sub P, going from structures to the reals. So for each, each part in our partition, we have a function from structures to reals. So that if you look in a structure in your class with parameter B bar, then the size of phi m b bar will be, at least roughly, h p of m, that real number, provided m b is in that part. So th this, this really conveys exactly what we want. It, 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 uh, be because in the previous slide, we talked about definable partitions. 
we've got this definability clause that that we know which part MV, MB is in. So we, 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 um, we've got a uniform way of defining, of, defi of saying about B that MB lies in that part. <coughs> so, <coughs> so we have this definability clause and we're saying that phi MB bar has size, if you like, HP1 of M or possibly HP2 of M or HPK of M. There are finitely many possibilities. And it's all approximate, this, this error term here. So this definition does capture what we wanted. Um, there's a version of this where rather than this equation having um, this error term, you just have equality. You just say phi mb bar has, is exactly hp of m. There, Definable sets are given exactly in cardinality. A stronger condition. So the idea of this definition is that the size of this definable set, phi m b bar, is a function of m. So it's a, fun a function from this class of functions, this r. It's a function of m where the, the function you choose depends just on the part of b bar. If you like, we had this part P here, and the function was H sub P, so it depended just on P. The, the notion of R Mac is a strengthening of R Mac, um, which requires the uniformity to be exact rather than approximate. So I don't know if that makes reasonable sense. I mean, I say, I find it very hard to convey this definition. Um, if, it, if it's unclear, maybe sort of stick to the idea that we're generalizing the notion as an object class and we're not worrying about what the size of definable sets are. We're just, we're just saying there's a fixed number of sizes of definable set. Any questions at this stage? Any? any... Can you push me more on this? <laughs> Yeah, maybe I have just one question. What's the, uh, maybe maybe you're gonna say it right now, but what's the? Uh, I'm I'm not entirely certain that I understand uh, in what sense it generalizes the n-dimensional asymptotic class. Okay, well, well, maybe maybe just think about the the one-dimensional asymptotic class. And the one-dimensional case, our functions were of the form. Well, in the in the original th theorem. About finite fields, there were functions going from q to mu q to the d. Mm -hmm. So these these functions are would just take uh, your your c would be your class of finite fields. So you would just take f q to a function of the form mu q to the d. And we you know we saw that there were given the formula of phi, there were finitely many pairs mu d. So you get finite. So for the formula of phi. You've got finitely many functions uh, of the form q goes to mu q to the d. So really what we're doing is we're we're just relaxing what those functions are, not worrying about the form of them. All right. Thanks. Okay. okay, thanks. Yeah. And I just mentioned here, there's a you could there's a weakening of this. Um, you can drop the definability clause on the partition. Still, this, this definition still has content if you don't require that the parts of the partition are uniformly definable. So we call that a weak MAC or a weak MEC. Okay, so I'll try and convey what one can do with this definition. So some basic facts. So first of all, if you want to prove that a class is an R MAC or an R MAC, it's good enough to look at formulas by x, y bar, where x is a single variable. Of course, the, of course, the result is about where x bar is a tuple. If you can prove the result where x is a single variable, that implies it for all formulas. <laughs> so this is really a kind of fibering argument. It uses the definability clause. And I would kind of compare how with ominimality, the definition of ominimality is a one variable condition. It says that a definable set 
in one variable is a finite union of open intervals and singletons. But it gives you an end, end variable consequence, namely cell decomposition. The second comment, this is in Wolf's PhD thesis, that if C is a, a Mac or a Mac, then so is any class of finite structures which is uniformly bisepitable to C. I won't define that, but you can kind of imagine what uniformly bisepitable ought to mean. Um, but the condition isn't preserved just in one direction, uninterpretability, say, uninterpretability, because Supposing you take a class, suppose you take a Mac and take a Redux where you throw away some of the language, then you might lose the formulas which do the, which do the definability, do the definability clause. So you might lose that definability clause. But you still find that any class which is uniformly interpretable in a Mac is a weak Mac, similarly for Macs. So you retain something. Okay, so to give you a few examples. So some of these I've already hinted at. Um, so this was a, from a paper of Dario Garcia, myself, and Charlie Steinhorn. Um, so if you look at these two sorted structures I mentioned earlier, where you have vector space and FQ, then this is a Mac. And basically the point is that given a formula phi xy, there's a finite set E sub phi of polynomials in two sort in two indeterminates. Think of it as a, a bold face V, bold face F. Um, polynomials over the rationals. So that if M is one of these structures, finite structures, then any definable set has size roughly G of cardinality V, cardinality for some G in this family. So in other words, definable sets are given as a, <coughs> a two variable polynomial in the size of the vector space and the size of the field. So that gives you that this is a Mac. So here, the, the ultra products are still super simple. But we've moved beyond the original kind of setting because now the the ultra product the V sort may have rank omega. We're getting infinite rank phenomena. So you're already getting new phenomena here. Another example close to what I mentioned earlier. Um, say you look at say fix a number D and look at all the finite residue rings Z on NZ. So what does D do? You just insist that N involves at most D different primes, and each prime has exponents at most D. So that's going to be a weak Mac, and it can be made into a Mac by a slight expansion of the language. And here, ultra products will be super simple. And I just mentioned this, just I won't, I won't go into this, but if you take finite, if you take a quiver, it's basically like a digraph. Um, and there are certain quivers, basically very close to Dinkin diagrams, which de uh, these quivers determine an algebra, a path algebra. And you can, you can look at the modules over this path algebra. So they will, they will form a weak Mac, and you can make them into a Mac. Um, so you're looking at here at three sort of structures. You've got the field, the algebra, and the module. Well, I won't spend time on that now. Okay. What about so far? I had asymptotic classes and then measurable structures. So a measurable structure, we got examples as ultra products of asymptotic classes. We've now got generalized well, we've got multi-dimensional asymptotic classes, and there's a corresponding notion of generalized measurable structure. I want to say something about that. So the setting here is we have what I'm calling an ordered semi-ring. 
So we got a we got two an additive ordered modide um, and a multiplicative one. Distributive law. There's an ordering least element zero, and there's some basic compatibility conditions given here. So it's just some definition of an, of an ordered semi ring. And then we want to be able to say that there's this equivalence relation where two elements are equivalent if they're sort of in the same Archimedean class. So if B lies between A and NA, or by so NA is just A plus A plus A N times. So you get this equivalence relation. Look at the quotient. That gives you a, a notion of dimension on S. So it gets some sort of notion of dimension. And then we have this strange axiom here, this axiom for measuring semi ring, which I won't I won't spend time on, but it's it's kind of what we want. Okay. So given one of these measuring semi rings and a structure out, M is now an infinite structure. Some language. So you say that M is S measurable, so it's measurable in the semi ring. If there's a function from the definable sets to S, so def M just means all the definable sets in any number of variables. So it's definable sets in one variable, two variables, three variables, all of them. And we're aligned parameters here. So we've got a function like this. So for finite sets, H of a set is just its cardinality, like one plus one plus one n times. You've got this additivity condition that for disjoint union, H of X union Y is just H of X plus H of Y. And then you've got this condition which is very similar to what we saw in the original finite field theorem. That if you have a a uniformly definable family of definable sets given by some formula phi, then there's a finite subset of S, a finite subset of S of S, such that definable sets in this in this family get assigned values in F. So you can think of this as like saying that you can think of F as like um, the functions, finitely many functions, mu1, q to the d1 mu2, q to the d2, and so on. And then we have a, a, a Fubini clause. So this says if you have a definable function x to y, and all, the, so then the, the fibers of this function, the pre-images, form a uniformly definable family. So they will all be assigned some value under h. Suppose they're all assigned the same value s, then h of x is h of y times f. So if you think of h of x as something like the size of x in some sense, we're saying the size of x should be the size of each fiber times the size of y. It's a reasonable kind of counting principle. So that's the notion of a, an S measurable structure. So just try to give intuition here. So back in the, the finite fields example, the, the Chatidakis, Van der Ries, McIntyre theorem, the findable sets had size roughly mu q to the d. So we can move to an ultra product of finite fields, their pseudo finite fields. So that, that'll actually be an S measurable structure where S is the ordered of monomials of the form mu x to the d. X is just some indeterminate here. So if you like, you've got the semi ring R x to the n, which is the collection of all these monomials mu x to the d. So this has this natural sort of lexicographic ordering where mu x to the d is less than mu x to the e, if d less than e are equal than mu less than u. So, and you can multiply monomials in the obvious way, and you add them according to this rule, that the exponent here is the dimension. And if the dimensions are the same, you add the measures, otherwise you just take the max. 
So that gives you a semi-ring structure on these monomials. And then out of the, the CDM theorem, you get that a pseudo-finite field is, me is me measurable in this semi-ring. That's a typical sort of example. Okay, so um, I'll take this a little bit faster here. So <clears throat> what I want to say really here is that the, the, I mentioned the set of dimensions used asymptotic classes. Um, that itself is a semi-ring structure, but also we, we actually get a semi-ring of the form R times X to the, these D, to D, to D, so these monomials. So in some sense, the example I gave last time was canonical. If you have a measurable structure, then it'll be measurable in a semi-ring of this sort, the mu x to the little d, where little d ranges through this, this capital D. So actually, these semi-rings can be taken to have a canonical form. And the, the operations here are roughly as I described as before. So when you multiply, you just multiply the coefficients and you add the exponents, add it, add in the semi-ring D. And when you add, it's like what I said before. <clears throat> okay. So such a set E will be a measuring semi-ring. And um, yeah, so I'll just say you can take your measuring semi-ring to have this form. R X to the D. Okay, I'll move on a bit, I think. So I'll try to give it give you the flavor of the consequences of this. So first of all, suppose that a structure M is S measurable in some semi-ring X. And suppose that the, the set of dimensions in S is well ordered. Then you could you, you obtain that M is super simple, so it's in a nice place in the stability hierarchy. And the idea is that you have this modular notion of forking, so forking forces a drop in or causes a drop in dimension. It's a fairly easy argument. So, as an example. Um, we looked at these structures, pairs V, F, Q, vector space, finite field. And I mentioned earlier, the defining functions for definable sets are, say, polynomials in two variables. And there, the corresponding set of dimensions will be well ordered. It'll be, <laughs> you've got, say, polynomials in two variables. Uh, it's going to be ordered like n squared, according to pairs of degrees. You just say that one degree dominates another degree. Or, so that's the idea. So things like that will be super simple. And similarly, to take, an, take a class of structures, we have a finite field, <coughs> vector space VF, VF, VK over, over the field, and a chain of subspaces, six, six lengths. So this will be S measurable, and it will be super simple by this condition here. So, we have, so this is a reasonably robust definition of measurability. So <clears throat> it's preserved by elementary equivalence. Okay. Um, it tells you something model theoretically. <clears throat> so if M is generalized measurable in our sense, then it doesn't have the strict order property. That means that there's no define that you, you can't have a definable partial order on a power of M, which has an infinite totally ordered subset. Rules out that sort of thing. For the same sort of reason that I said before that total orders are not an asymptotic class. Same sort of idea. And you also get that M is what we call functionally unimodular. That means if you have two definable surjections between sets A and B, 
say f1 is k1 to 1, f2 is k2 to 1, where these are both finite, then k1 equals k2. So I mentioned before that the complex field is not measurable. And it was because of the map x goes to x squared, it's 2 to 1. <laughs> so really, well, the, point, the point is the complex numbers are not functionally unimodular. It, follow, it, yeah, it follows that this is not generalized measurable. And in fact, any generalized measurable field, its absolute Galois group is, is Z hat, it's a finite completion of Z hat. But you get some strange examples. So in this world of let's say homogeneous structures, a nice example is the universal homogeneous triangle free graph. So in some sense, this has a bad model theory, it's what's called TP1, TP2, <laughs> but it is generalized measurable. This is a result of Sylvia Anscombe. It is generalized measurable with a rather strange measuring some earring. I won't spend time on that earring. And there are other examples that have been looked at of generalized measurable structures. Okay, so we get the expected sort of connection between the concepts. If you take a multidimensional asymptotic class of finite structures, that was my broader uniformity condition on finite structures then any ultra product will be generalized measurable. And so it has those various consequences. And if you take a, an exact class, where the cardinalities are given exactly, then the ultra product will be measurable in an ordered ring rather than semi-ring, or you can arrange it, it's an ordered ring. And that's a condition we don't really understand. We don't really know what it means. Um, and it does have some consequences. <clears throat> so if a structure is measurable in an ordered ring, then you have a definable function from a set to itself, then it's injective if and only if it's surjective. So having a ring means you have nice sort of cancellation arguments for sort the of cancelling. I won't do that in detail, but the idea. Okay. Just finishing. Is it okay if I take another two or three minutes? Is that all right? To the end. That's all right. Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll try to bring it to confusion. <laughs> okay. um, so I just wanted to finish by saying something about this notion of exact class. So where coordinates are given exactly. And I think there are some nice examples. <laughs> um, so this is. Basically, a result of Pillay with inside different language. If you take any strongly minimal set, so that's a structure where, in all models of the theory, any definable set is finite or cofinite. Take, suppose it's pseudo finite. Then it arises from a mech. So there's a mech whose ultra products are what elementary equivalent to M. And the functions giving cardinalities are basically given by polynomials over Z. And in fact, you can extend this to pseudo-finite out of one categorical structures. A nice result of Van Havel. And then, there's a curious result of Daniel Wolf that if you fix a finite language and fix a number D, and look at the collection of all finite L structures with the most D four types. Well, you can take that as saying that ORT M has a most D orbits on quadruples. So just a, a symmetry condition. And then and there's a slight, you have to allow yourself to slightly increase the language, but it's not really an issue. Then the class of structures is <laughs> an exact class. And the idea is the functions involved are polynomials in certain organizing geometries. So this follows from a very difficult monograph of Charlie and Rizovsky.
Um, and then we can fairly easily show that the class of finite graphs of degree at most d, the best bound of the degree, that's an exact class. And this is because of a kind of a quantum formulation result of Guy's number. And as mentioned here, the finite fields are very definitely not a mech, they're not even a weak mech. <clears throat> so the kind of examples that are very close to finite fields won't be mechs. So they're max, but not max. And likewise, um, the class of all finite abelian groups is a mech. <clears throat> um, so this, this is because of the PP quantification, essentially. And in the other direction, if you have a mech of groups, being a mech gives you a lot of information. It tells you that these groups are well, soluble by, bound, by bounded. They have a soluble normal subgroup of bounded index. And you can actually say more than that. So one might hope for more. One might be able to show that any mech of finite groups is not broken by bounded. Is not managed that. And the final thing, I think I, I, I ought to bring it to a close, but I just want to um, mention a conjecture that rather appeals to me. <laughs> um, so suppose you have a, a homogeneous structure in the sense of Fresse. So this is a countable structure, and any isomorphism between finite substructures lifts to an automorphism over a, this is over a finite relational language. <clears throat> then the idea is that, M, that two things are equivalent. One is that M is stable. And the other is that M is a limit of a mech in the sense that <clears throat> some other product of a mech is elementary equivalent to M. So in one direction, this is True. Two implies one is true. There's, there's a very strong structure theory of Lochlan from the 80s about um, stable homogeneous structures over finite languages. If you combine that with the Wolf results and other backgrounds, then two implies one just follows. <laughs> um, just to get a feeling for this, um, the random graph is is unstable and in fact the random graph is not a mech limit and for example i mentioned that um the paley graphs are a mac when you make the random graph but they're definitely not a mech <clears throat> so the conjecture holds the graphs um so we know about it in certain situations. So we know, um, I'd say, <clears throat> so we have this result, that for the following homogeneous structures, which are all, these are all unstable. <clears throat> for these structures, there is no mech without product in an equivalent to M. So they're not a mech limit. That includes the all homogeneous graphs, as we're classified by Lockham and Woodrow. <clears throat> So proving that is actually quite difficult. So it, it rests on this old paper of Cameron Guttel Seidel, which is sort of reasonably hard sort of spectral graph theory. So linear algebra arguments with Clayton's matrices. There's a short argument to show that the conjecture holds for homogeneous tournaments, holds for the generic di diagram. And there are certain other examples where we can show it. But in general, we're very far from showing this. And I think, I think it's quite an interesting conjecture. It's, it's really, it leads one to looking at, in a given language, the class of finite structures with, classes of finite structures with as much combinatorial regularity as you could hope for, but with no, assu no assumption of homogeneity or symmetry. Like that seems to take you into, Kind of hard combinatorial questions. I think I think have other interest. Okay, I've got a bit over, so I'll I'll stop there. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much.
Are there any more questions or remarks uh, after the talk? I'd love to have a copy of the slides, if that's possible. Okay, sure, yeah. yeah <laughs> Okay, also requests then. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Any other more requests or questions or remarks? If not, I think we can uh, thank our speaker again.